Hello everyone and welcome to Widio Academy. I'm Alessi Harman Rice and today I'll be talking to you about the art of time lapse, what it is, what you need and where to even start. And I'll also share some of my incredible tips that will get you shooting time lapses like a pro in no time at all. Working in broadcast and advertising has given me plenty of opportunities to really hone in my time lapse skills and I've shot things for the BBC as well as a ton of household names in the advertising world. So enough about me, now it's time to get into the nitty gritty of how to actually do time lapse photography. And there's a few different ways that you can do this. Each have their pros and cons, um, but I'm gonna explain those, what they are and what you should probably be doing. If you're wondering what a time lapse is, it's basically just a long period of time that's then sped up. So you might film for two hours of some clouds and you might speed that up into a one minute clip. So yeah, that's what time lapse is, it's just a lapse of time. So there's a few different ways that you can do time lapse photography and the first is just with an iPhone. Super simple, if you kind of swipe right on the app, it comes up with a little time lapse function. And if you keep it still for enough time, then you'll get a time lapse. And this is really great because maybe you haven't got your camera with you and there's something cool you want to time lapse. And it's also just very quick and easy to do. So that's one of the big pros of just shooting on your phone. It's just super simple. But one of the big cons is the quality isn't that great and you can't really do that much to it in post-production. So sort of like what you see is what you get really. The second option is to use a video camera and film for an extended period of time. And this is really good because you can sort of just press start. It's easy to set up like an iPhone. The quality is a lot better than your phone. But one of the big downsides is that the files tend to be massive. So if you're filming for an hour of 4K, you're looking at like a couple hundred gigs depending what camera you're using. So it's just not really that effective or efficient to be kind of working like that. And that leads me into my favorite method of taking time lapse photography, and that is using a DSLR. And the reason why I like to use a DSLR is that you can kind of control the photos, you have a lot of room to play with them in post, uh, the file sizes are a lot smaller than a video camera, and it's just also kind of like the golden standard for professionals in the industry, so you should be doing the same too. And another reason to use a DSLR is that you get to do long exposures. So this is something you can't really do on a video camera. And if you're doing things like nighttime photography of the stars, or you want like moving traffic and stuff like that, then you want to do long exposure on a DSLR. And that just gives you loads of room to experiment as well. The downside to using a DSLR is post-production can be tedious. You've got to stitch all these photos together, you've got to edit the photos. And yeah, it just takes a lot longer to do than if you did it on a video camera. But the results are definitely worth it. I like to shoot my time lapses with Sony cameras. I also use Canon. Uh, so it really depends on what the situation you're in. I also do a lot of motion control time lapses as well. And for that, you need specialist equipment. And I like the stuff from Dynamic Perception as well as the Motimo. They make really great stuff. And Kessler also do some good little motion rigs. So the first thing I like to do before I even go out and shoot is just research my locations. Um, there's nothing worse than kind of lugging all your kit around and you don't know what you're going to film. So these days the internet is just a great tool for kind of looking and seeing what's out there. Maybe there's a photographer in your area that takes some cool landscape pictures. So for me that's always a good start. Just go to those little kind of hot spots and kind of like not replicate but sort of take inspiration from what they've shot and just go out there and use that so you've got a clear image in your head. So once I've found my inspiration I will then go on a recce. And what a recce is is just reconnaissance. So you're just going out there just to see the lay of the land if there's like loads of people, if it's a bit of a dodgy area, you sort of want to go there before you bring all your equipment with you just to kind of scope it out. Whilst I'm on my recce as well, I use an app called Sunseeker and this is really, really great. So basically it tells you where the sun's going to be at certain points in the day. When I did the Stonehenge shoot for the BBC, this was really effective as it meant I didn't have to get there for sunrise to see where the sun was going to be. So we did a recce the day before. I could use this app to kind of plan where the sun was going to be in between Stonehenge and in the morning it was pitch black, but I knew exactly where I had to have my camera. And yeah, the sun was exactly where it should be. So yeah, definitely check out Sunseeker, it's a great app. And then when I am setting up my time lapses, I like to give myself a bit of time. So if it's a sunrise shot, I like to get there maybe like an hour or two beforehand, depending on what I'm doing. If it's a static time lapse without the motion control rig, then I can do it in like maybe like half an hour. But if I'm kind of setting up a motion control rig, I want at least like two hours to one hour to kind of just set everything up perfectly and get it all running nicely before the sun rises because you sort of only have one shot, don't you? These are my top tips on how to shoot time lapses like an absolute boss. 
So number one, shoot in manual mode. And I can't stress this enough, this is super, super important. A lot of people, they just kind of want to be easy, put it in auto mode, but you just can't do that with time lapse. And the reason for that is you want all your photos to be consistent because if they're sort of flickering in between with different exposures, it's just going to be really nasty to watch and it's really ugly as well. So yeah, you, you really want to control everything about your image. And by doing it in manual mode, you've got complete control. So yeah, always shoot manual. Secondly, you want to shoot in RAW. And this gives you a lot of freedom in post. So if you've messed up and you've put the wrong right balance on or the exposure is a bit too dark, you can normally just save it in the post-production phase because it kind of saves all this information to the RAW file. And there's been loads of times where I've had the wrong right balance or something's messed up, but I've managed to kind of save the image in post because I shot in RAW. Number three, plan your shot. And the best time lapses that I've ever created were the ones that I researched beforehand and I had a clear vision of what I wanted before I kind of went there and did the time lapse. So yeah, use the internet to your advantage, research locations, kind of just check the weather, see what's out there. And number four is use manual lenses. So even though you're shooting in manual mode, a lot of kind of modern lenses, the iris or the aperture, kind of like changes ever so slightly between the shots and you'll still get a bit of flicker. But if you're using like manual lenses, such as like a Samyang or something like that, then you're really like eliminating the kind of flicker that you'll be getting from an auto lens. Number five is bring some friends. And this is a bit of an odd one, but time lapses are super boring. You're waiting around doing nothing for hours. So if you've got some mates with you to help pass the time, it's just a great way to kind of spend an evening and you get a cool little souvenir of a time lapse at the end of it. And yeah, all my mates have always been pretty stoked to kind of have this little time lapse of, of this like, little memory. So I've covered the top tips and these are the biggest mistakes that you should be avoiding. Number one, touching the camera. Now this is a biggie and it's kind of really exciting when you do your time lapse and you sort of want to see the results and see how it's looking. But by doing that, you might turn the camera off, you might nudge the camera so like footage goes all wobbly and you can't use it. So yeah, as tempting as it may be, just don't touch the camera. Number two, not charging your batteries. And this again is something that I've fallen victim to many times. I've not really checked my batteries or I've just assumed they're all fully charged. I sort of set up my time lapse, go away, come back half an hour later, realize it's died halfway through and I've just wasted kind of like an hour or two of my evening. So yeah, it's super easy to avoid, but yeah, just make sure that you're always charging your batteries and you kind of know what their status is before you're using them. Number three, shooting in JPEG. And this is a common mistake. People want to keep the file sizes down, which I understand. But what this does is just kind of shoots yourself in the foot and you can't really do anything to JPEGs in post uh, compared to a raw image. So yeah, just shoot in raw, that's the law. Number four, setting the wrong interval. And this is where you kind of have your intervals too fast and the camera can't keep up. And basically what that means is you're gonna lose frames. You're also gonna have kind of jumpy footage where you're gonna have different intervals. So yeah, you can avoid this by just setting, like a, or doing some tests and figuring out what your camera buffer speed is. And number five is not checking the weather. And this is a simple one, but there's nothing worse than being soaking wet. So yeah, just do your due diligence and just check the weather. Another common mistake is on my time-lapse rig. So I've got it hanging off the edge of a building and you always wanna make sure for safety reasons that it's either it's kind of like heavily secure. So you always make sure that I put a sandbag on it and kind of weigh it down. Another mistake is not climatizing your kit. And I did this mistake myself. I was in the Arctic Circle filming the Northern Lights. There was a campfire. I thought I'll warm up my camera, kind of sat around it. Then the Northern Lights came out and everyone rushed out to kind of film these lights. And within about 10 minutes, the whole camera just completely froze up. And yeah, I couldn't film anything for the rest of the night. So that was a bit of a bummer. So I've been doing my research and I found this wicked rooftop. It's in central London. And I'm gonna set my time lapse up there now and do a little demonstration for you. So tonight I'm gonna be doing two types of time lapse. And the first one I wanna to talk to you about is the static time lapse. Now, the reason why I love this time lapse is it's so easy to do. All you need is a steels camera, a sturdy tripod, and something called an intervalometer. So when I'm setting a time lapse shot, the first thing I'll do is take the camera off the tripod, and I kind of move the camera around, kind of set up different compositions until I find something that I'm happy with. And one of the things I love about time lapse, but also it's kind of a bit of a curse at the same time, is you've got to be a perfectionist because if you sort of don't really commit to a shot and you just kind of quickly set it up, maybe it's not level or not in focus, and you leave it there for an hour, you kind of come back and you check that footage and you've literally just wasted an hour of your time and you can't use any of that footage. So it really is a baptism of fire because if you get it wrong, you kind of pay a heavy price of just wasting your time. So you really, really want to get it right before you kind of commit to doing an hour long time lapse or something like that. 
Now, I recommend shooting in manual mode. Sometimes if you're shooting a sunset or a sunrise, you might want it in aperture mode. This is because the exposure is sort of changing with the scenery. However, if you're not that kind of skilled in post-production, you end up with just really flickery footage um, because each shot has a different exposure and isn't consistent. So to kind of keep everything consistent, you want to be shooting in manual mode, and this is going to limit the flicker as much as possible in camera. And then once you've set your camera to manual mode, the next thing you want to do is kind of get your ISO down to as low as you possibly can. The reason why you want to have a low ISO is because it lowers the noise in the image. So if you shot like a really high ISO, you might not need a very long shutter speed, but then your footage is going to be super grainy and it's just not going to look very nice. So using a lower ISO and a longer shutter speed, that's going to give you a much, much higher quality image. And also you, you get the added bonus of kind of light streaks and loads of cool effects that you would get in a long exposure. And lastly, your aperture. Now, when you're doing landscapes, you kind of want everything to be in focus. So it's not like this shot where it's kind of got quite a wide open aperture. You want everything to be kind of closed down and in focus. Using like an aperture of F8 or F11 is going to ensure that your photos are crisp, sharp, and of the highest of quality. So that's very, very important that your kind of everything's in focus. Otherwise, it's just going to look a bit rubbish and a bit amateur. So I'm just going to frame up. Um, I've got a nice skyline behind me here. I think that's quite a nice shot. I've got my slider in the foreground. I've got the buildings in the background. And what I'm going to do next is just take a little test photo. And maybe lower the ISO as well. I'm on quite high ISO at the moment. So I'm going to go down to about 1600. Let's just see how that comes out. Yeah, that's great. And I'm just going to tilt the camera up a bit as well. Just get a bit more of the sky. I've also got the moon in the background, so that's going to look really great. Cool. So I'm happy with that. So the next thing I'm going to do is switch the lights on so you guys can see what I'm doing. Finally, once you've got your shot locked off, your settings locked into the camera, the last thing you want to do is set up your intervalometer. And the intervalometer that I'm using for my static setup is a Canon TC80 N3. It's a really, very good, reliable kind of remote. However, you can get them off Amazon for about 10 or 15 quid, and I've used them loads of times and they do the job just fine. So just go through my settings once more. We're gonna skip through this part because we don't need that for what we're doing tonight. The next is interval. We've got a four second interval. That's gonna give us plenty of time for the camera to write to the card. And we're not gonna get a backlog of photos. Long exposure, I've set it to two seconds. I'm on a one second exposure, but I mean, it's always better to be on the safe side. And frames is set to infinity. So that's going to keep going until I tell it to stop. So it will take 25 minutes for that to take all the photos I need, but I'm just going to let it run because I've got quite a big card in there and it doesn't matter too much if it's going to be taking them. So once you're happy, all you have to do is press start. But the first thing I'm going to do is to say battery is just to turn the screen off. Um, so I've turned my screen off and ready to go. And I'm just going to press start on that. So after 25 minutes, I have my 250 photos and yeah, I'll be quite happy with that. So I'm gonna leave that one to keep going whilst I set up my next shot. I've got my static time-lapse running nicely and now we're gonna move on to my motion control time-lapse rig. Now I've kind of gone ahead and already set this up. I've sort of scouted out a location that I quite like the look of. Um, I wanna get a nice shot of these buildings and it's on a rail here. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna move across the rail and get a nice shot kind of overhanging the rooftop here. So the camera's gonna like kind of look over, pan down and kind of move across. Um, so I've kind of got that already framed up. I've done some kind of test exposures in camera as well. So I've kind of got all that set up already as I kind of talked about earlier. A bit more about the rig I'm using today. It's a dynamic perception stage zero and that is the rail. It's six foot long, comes with a, re uh, a motor and a cart. And then to control the rig, I'm using an Emotimo TB3 Black Edition. Now this is really cool because it's very intuitive. You control everything with a nunchuck, sort of a bit like a Wii controller. And it also has a pan and tilt motor in it as well. So you're getting all three axes of movement with this rig. And that is basically creme de la creme of time-lapse. Um, so we're gonna get some really, really exciting stuff tonight. So the first thing you wanna do is turn your machine on. And once that happens, you kind of connect your little nunchuck and you wanna choose the two point move. So you go select. Uh, you move it to your starting position. I've already got it in my position, so I hit next. And then the next one is you want to move it to your end position. Now I'm not going to move it all the way to the rail for this example, so I'm just going to move it slowly. So to move the rig, you just sort of tilt it like this. And as you can see, it's moving along 
quite nicely. One of the annoying things about this rig is the motors have to be super, super torquey. But what that means is they're quite slow. So it could take quite a while for it to get to the other end of the six foot rail. So I'm just going to stop it here. Then you kind of use the analog stick to move the camera around. And this is super cool. And because I'm getting it kind of looking up, I want to kind of have the camera pointing down for when it finishes. So I'm going to do that. I'm happy with that. Next is the interval. Now the emoji mode does the intervals a bit differently to how an intervalometer does it. You don't get one for interval and one for exposure time. It's all kind of combined. So for this one, I want at least three seconds between my photos and the exposure is five seconds. So I'm going to make my interval eight. And I really like this emoji mode because it's kind of super clever in the way that it kind of presents the data to you. Now it's telling me how many frames do I want, but not only that, it's telling me how long it's going to take to complete that movement. At the moment, it's set to 240 frames. I want 10 seconds of footage, so I'm going to boost that up to 250. So yeah, I've got it on 250 now. That's saying it's going to be about 33 minutes, which is pretty good to be fair. Sometimes if you're doing astro time-lapse photography, it can take anywhere up from one hour to two hours. So 30 minutes really isn't that bad. Um, so once I'm happy with that, you click next. And then the next thing it comes up with is static time. So the static time basically means how long the camera is going to be waiting after it's kind of done the motorized move before taking the next photo. So I want it to be maybe a half a second, because that's just going to give the camera enough time to settle before taking the next photo. Yeah, and then once you're happy with that, you move on to the next section. And this is basically asking you how many frames you want to ramp in and out. And what this means is instead of going at a constant speed, it sort of like gradually speeds up and then slows down. And this is quite nice, it's quite subtle and kind of gives you like an in and out point of your footage. So I normally give it like 50 frames of ramping. So yeah, once you're ready, you just hit start or move to the starting position. So then you basically just wait around, let it do its thing and then kind of just check in and see what your results are like. So I've just finished my motion control time-lapse rig move. I'm really happy with how the footage has turned out. It's time to go into the post-production. So I hope you enjoyed the demonstration and now it's onto my favourite part of the process, the post-production. And this is where you kind of see your time-lapse come to life or maybe it crashes and burns and you go cry in a corner. So the software I'm using today is called LR Time-Lapse Pro 5 and this works in conjunction with Adobe Lightroom and I love using this software as it kind of acts as a quality control feature and there's also a super simple workflow of how to create your first time-lapse. So what you want to do is import your sequences and I've been super organized and kind of split my time-lapse sequences up into little subfolders. This just makes it a bit neater and a bit easier. There is an import function on LR time-lapse, but this is just way more easy and more neat. So once you kind of click on your time-lapse, it's going to load it in like this. And as you can see, you got all your metadata and things like that. And the first thing you want to do is go into keyframe wizard. Now what this does is it adds in keyframes and these are the things you actually edit in Lightroom because to edit kind of over 200 photos it's just going to take forever and you're also not going to get it very precise. So what you want to do is add in some keyframes. Now if you're doing a sunset it's going to maybe start light and get darker so you're going to want to kind of balance that exposure out and kind of keep everything consistent. However as I shot this on manual mode and it's pretty consistent with the lighting, like nothing really changes. Um, I'm probably just going to use two keyframes for this today. So what I want to do is go down here and these diamonds represent a keyframe. So I'm just going to click on that. Another way to do it is to go on the keyframe wizard here and click on the pluses. But this is just a bit more precise by clicking it on there. So once you've got your keyframes in place, you go to save. And what that does is it saves all the metadata to the camera files and now it's ready to be put into Lightroom. So now the next phase is to go drag to Lightroom. So I'm just gonna click on that and I'm using two screens today. So I'm just dragging it into Lightroom right now. Um, just close this window, bring in Lightroom. Awesome. So as you can see, it's brought in all the photos here ready to be imported. Now I've already imported these so I don't have to do it again. But what you do is just go and import and I'm just gonna click on cancel. And yeah, as you can see, we've got all our images here. It's all kind of very dark, very moody. And what we're gonna try and do today is just brighten those up. What you wanna do is just to get your keyframes is go down to filter and click on 
keyframes here. And the way that keyframes are marked is with like a star rating system. So anything four star or higher is a keyframe. So we're gonna start on our first keyframe here. And I'm just clicking on D and that brings us up to the develop tab. Yeah, and as you can see, super, super dark. So what you wanna do is just gonna bang up that exposure straight away. Um, maybe kind of bring down the highlights as well. And also kind of bring the blacks down with it. Maybe kind of pop whites up a bit as well. And boost the shadows just to kind of get it a bit nicer. And also going to boost our saturation and the vibrance as well and sort of make it a bit colorful. And I find sometimes when you export these, it kind of gets dulled down a bit in the export phase. So I kind of like to add a bit of color in this phase here because it kind of gets reduced when you export it as a ProRes. So once you're kind of happy with it, maybe add a bit of clarity as well. And it's kind of, you gotta be careful here not to go crazy with it. Like it could be tempting to kind of boost the clarity because it looks cool or kind of boost the shadows, but that's just gonna make your time-lapse look over-processed and it's very, very ugly. So just gonna bring those back. Um, and boost the exposure here as well. Cool, so yeah, as you can see, that took about a minute and this is what it looks like and this is where we got it. So yeah, super, super quick and super easy. Now, the next thing you wanna do is apply this to your next photo. So it's gonna do that and go up to here and click on this little script icon and just go sync keyframes. Do that. Cool. So there you go. And that's just synced out time lapse across here. And I might actually boost the shadows up here because as the time lapse moves, you kind of see more of this roof and it's quite cool to see that. So it's going to bring those up a bit more, maybe just boost the exposure very slightly. And there's also noise reduction in Lightroom. So sometimes you can just apply maybe like a tiny bit of that, but you don't want to do too much of it because it's just going to make your image very soft, like if you kind of go in, you can kind of see. So yeah, it's adding a tiny bit of noise reduction. Cool, so there you go. That is our two keyframes done and edited, and it's looking great already. Now you wanna go back and hit G on your keyboard, and that just brings up the grid view in the library. And we've got two keyframes here, but as you can see, our sequence still hasn't got those effects applied to them. Now, if you're not using LR time lapse, the easiest way to do this is to highlight everything and go sync. Um, actually, you might need to do that in the develop tab. Go sync, and that would sync all your settings across. However, we don't want to do that because we want to have a gradual kind of change of the values from our first keyframe to our last. So what we're going to do is just go back into grid view, get our keyframes to pop up again. And the way that Lightroom and LR Timelapse talk to each other is through the metadata. So you go up to metadata and you want to click save metadata to files. And what that's going to do is just save all this information to the file and make it easy to re-import that into LR Timelapse. So next you want to go onto LR Timelapse and just kind of load this back up. And as you can see, we've made our change in Lightroom, but it hasn't kind of been brought across. So you wanna click on reload, and that's just gonna load in all the adjustments you made. And as you can see, it's sort of picked up on it here. And the next step is to go auto transition. Now what this phase does is it kind of gradually adjusts the values from the first keyframe to the last. If you've got different keyframes, it will kind of do it in between those. And yeah, it didn't take very much time at all. So next you wanna go visual previews. And what this does is kind of makes like little DNG files and as you can see, yeah, it's starting to populate here. And these are all your little images. And shortly you'll be able to kind of play back your time lapse and kind of check the exposure and see if all your adjustments have worked out nicely. Perfect, now all our photos have imported in nicely and the little previews have been made. So I'm just gonna click play. And as you can see, that is looking very, very nice. Yeah, so I'm very happy with that. Cool. But to go next step further, and this is something you can't do in Lightroom, we wanna kind of get rid of some of that flicker. Now flicker can happen from when you're taking a photo in like aperture priority mode, the exposures could be different between the different photos, 
or if you're shooting in manual mode like we are today, um, you may not get that much flicker, but when you go into the post-production and start to edit the photos, you can actually reintroduce flicker into your time-lapse. So it's always best practice to kind of turn on your visual deflicker. So I'm just gonna go for the basic settings today and click apply. Now you can apply this as many times as you want, but because there's kind of lots of lights turning on, it might freak the software out a bit and might actually make the software, might actually make the time-lapse more flickery. So I'm just gonna use the basic setting today and see how that one turns out. And you can sort of see it here. It's kind of smoothing out this luminance curve and getting rid of all those kind of nasty spikes. And that will be what is causing the flicker, those little spikes. And I'm just gonna click on play. Yeah, and look at that, nice and buttery smooth. Perfect, cool. So now that we are happy with how everything's kind of turned out, we are gonna go over to Lightroom now and export our image sequence. Cool, so we have got our image sequence here, and as you can see, we've got our two keyframes, so we wanna go over here and do full sequence. And we've got our nice kind of edited photo here, but this whole sequence is still ugly and dark. So you wanna go Command A, highlight everything, go over to the metadata and go read metadata from files. And what this is gonna do is just gonna pull up all the adjustments that LR Timelapse made to our photos. And as you can see, it's sort of like populating here and it's looking great. So it's gonna give that a few moments just to kind of load in. And the next step is to go to export. Oh, and because this is a import thing, you're just gonna to have to find our, there you go. Cool, so next you wanna open up your little window tab, and this is the same step if you've just got Lightroom. However, LR Timelapse just makes it that a little bit more simple, and it lets you choose your resolution. So for today, we're gonna to go 4K, and just do 8 bits, and you wanna choose your target folder. Cool, and that is where our photo is gonna get saved. It's gonna make it an image sequence as well, so basically we'll put like a number after each thing. And this basically just tells the software that's an image sequence and to basically render the whole video as one thing rather than loads of little images. So once you're happy, you just click on export. And this takes a bit of time, so bear with me. Awesome, so as you can see, the little bars disappeared and all our photos have exported nicely. And if we just go back across into LR time lapse, this render video box has now appeared and it's asking us how we would like to make our, or render our video. So there's loads of options here, uh, different codecs, I know we do ProRes, click 4K. And because the ratio that we shot the photo at wasn't 16 by nine, it's asking where we want to kind of crop the uh, image. And there's this little box here, kind of lets you do that. Now I'm actually on an M1 MacBook and I know there's a new version of LR time apps called LR Timelapse 6. However, I'm still using LR Timelapse 5 and I find that the export can be a bit touch and go and it's not always reliable and I always find it kind of glitches and messes up. So I'm gonna show you another way of how I like to export my time lapses. So I've just loaded up my After Effects project and I use After Effects for processing my time lapse sequences into video. And this is just because it gives you great control and lets you kind of make any micro adjustments. So for instance, you could have like wobbly footage or there could be kind of birds or things like that that you might wanna mask out. So yeah, using it in Adobe After Effects is definitely the best way to kind of compile your JPEG sequences. So to bring in your JPEG sequence, what you wanna do is just go into here, time lapse exports tutorial. And yeah, if we go rendered sequence, that's our little image sequence that Lightroom has exported for us. And it's nicely numbered as well. So as you can see, After Effects has detected that this is a JPEG sequence. And it's very important that you make sure this box is ticked. Because if it's not, what it's gonna do is import hundreds of photos and it's just not gonna make it into a video. So you go import JPEG sequence, click on open. And as you can see, it's kind of made a little composition here and we've got our nice sequence there as well. Now, for some reason, it's really annoying, but After Effects always makes our J 
JPEG sequences 30 frames and um, because we're PAL we want this to be 25 so you just go click on main interpret footage and here you can just adjust until after effects what you want it to be so I want this to be 25 frames click on OK and just go open up here and that should be now playing back at 25 frames and because it imported it as 30 we're actually gonna have to make this composition a bit longer so it's gonna add on make it 10 seconds and we also want it to be 4k as well so just click on this to make it 4k um, maybe type in tutorial roof one cool so there we go got our sequence now and if I just kind of zoom out yeah you can see look at that we were missing all that kind of footage there so what you want to do is just drag that out and I'm just going to bring this back and shorten the sequence. Cool. So we've got our kind of time lapse here and this is the bit where you want to kind of scale it back a bit just to kind of make it fit into your little time lapse box. Cool. So got it there and it'll be quite nice because as the time lapse is going, you can sort of see the moon. So it would be quite nice to kind of keep the moon in the whole shot, but also show some of the uh, rooftop here as well to kind of show the movement of the dolly system. So I think out of the box, that's actually all right. But another thing you can do as well, so say if you've got a static time lapse, you want to introduce a bit of movement, you can kind of keyframe your positions. Uh, so if I go back here, and let's say we zoom up here and sort of see the top of the skyscraper, and then you maybe want to go the way down more with the floor. It kind of exaggerates that move even more. So actually that is quite cool. And to make it play back better as well, I'm just going to drop the quality down. Cool, and yeah, and as you can see, we've kind of added in our little position keyframes. And it kind of helps exaggerate that move from the dolly system as well. And actually it looks quite cool. But for what we're doing today, I think I'm actually just going to get rid of our keyframes and just kind of keep it as it was. Um, boost this back up to here. Cool, yeah, we've got the moon in shot. Nice, yeah, it looks really, really great. Cool. So one thing you can do to export is to go to the render queue within After Effects. However, as another kind of quality control and just best practice, you always want to do your exports in Media Encoder. So as you can see, it's kind of loaded in our sequence here from After Effects. And it's kind of asking us where we want to save it. So I'm just going to go into here. Video. And just click on Export. Do Save. Now for the codecs, I always like to do in ProRes just because this is a lossless codec and it's very versatile as well and will often work with most kind of editing softwares like Final Cut and things like that. Um, there's obviously, you can do 444, but I decided to do 422HQ because I find it's really reliable and never really have any issues with it. Um, if you wanted to do previews or didn't want to have as large a file, you could do H.264. However, you start to run into problems when you start, if you want to manipulate that footage. So yeah, always do your time lapse as, a pro, as ProRes and you can't really go wrong with that. Cool, so it's gonna go on OK and hit export. And as you can see, we've got a little thumbnail here that's rendering out nicely. So there you have it. Timelapses are as easy as that, even motion controlled, complicated ones like this one here. When it comes to inspiration, I'm always on the lookout for new ideas and techniques. And a few of the guys I follow are Michael Shainblum, Drew Garassi, and Mark Donahoe. These guys are really cool, they're always changing the game in time lapse and definitely worth a follow. I also like to experiment with photography and I've got a little vintage sort of uh, Nimzo 3D and I quite like taking photos with this because you can sort of create different images and that's sort of one of the reasons why I like time lapse photography is you get to manipulate kind of photos and kind of turn them into these weird videos. So yeah, I'm always experimenting with new ideas, kind of just like looking on Instagram, TikTok, Things like that, there's always creators out there kind of doing new things, like completely messing with digital footage. So that was really fun. I enjoyed doing this little masterclass and I'd like to thank Video Academy as well for having me. 
If you'd like to learn more about time lapse, just go check out my website at alessihr.com.